Coming up, young natives are tuning in to watch strong native characters on not one, but two TV series. How can that shape their lives? We'll talk with Janice Meeding. Plus, fires continue to burn in the West. Already 24,000 acres are burning on the Umpqua National Forest Land. We'll talk with Brian Bull and get an update. I'm Patty Thawahumba. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquilly, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungva. Results from Census 2020 are in, and it shows a large increase in the population of American Indians and Alaska Natives. They now represent nearly 3% of the U.S. population. The 9.7 million people is an increase from the 2010 census of more than 4 million people for the race. However, experts say the jump is much more complicated than the result of a successful census outreach campaign on tribal lands. The numbers point to more mixed-race families wanting to embrace their heritage, even if they are not recognized as tribal citizens. The census does not require proof of tribal citizenship. Yvette Rubidoux, the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians, says the numbers reflect the diversity that is being seen today. But Rubidoux and tribal advocates say it's likely the latest census data is still an undercount, which will lead to underfunding for tribal programs. The National Urban Indian Family Coalition is launching its Thriving Cities Initiative speaking series. Elected officials and policymakers will discuss issues urban Native people face. The organization says that more than 70 percent of Native Americans and Alaska Natives may not benefit from the historic investments Indian country has seen because those funds are intended for tribal lands. Rio Fernandez is the Civic Engagement Director for the National Urban Indian Family Coalition and says he hopes this series will spark civic engagement. It's not something you just try to fire up a few months before the election. That's why we want to do this Thriving Cities uh, series in what is kind of considered the off year, in a year in which there's not going to be a midterm election, there's not going to be a presidential election, and stuff like that. We want to start making this as an opportunity for Native people to be centered, to be included in these conversations. The first stop in the series will be in Oklahoma City, where Native leaders will speak with the mayor and state and county lawmakers. Women make up half of the college-educated workforce, but only 28 percent of them go into science and engineering. That's according to the National Science Board, and one Arizona nonprofit is hoping to change that. Caitlin Anawa Boisel has more on taking up space camp. I thought it would just look like we, you'd be under the clouds, but you were basically in the clouds. 11-year-old Suvi is from the Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Tribe in Wisconsin. This is her first plane ride ever, and she is going to space camp. It's been fun because you know that it's not just like you who's Native. A group of seven young Native girls between the ages of 9 and 12 have been learning the ropes of space at the Space Education Camp in Huntsville, Alabama. The girls learn everything from science, space, problem solving, and even being positive about their own bodies. And so we just wanted to have a program that we can uplift uh, Native American girls and give them an opportunity, have a little bit of social uh, educational equity, so that way they can uh, pursue STEM or pursue anything they want. Uh, this actually just gives them a sense of confidence. So if they can do STEM and science, it's really tough stuff. I think that can translate to 
anything that they want to do, they'll know that they have the confidence to accomplish it. Before the girls go to camp, they have a 32 week long course on basic space knowledge and also meet with native STEM leaders such as John Harrington, one of the first natives in space. Well, we decided that, you know, just one year of space camp is good and that's a solid foundation. But if a girl comes here for three years, plus our 32 weeks <laughs> of mentoring, that's going to make a huge impact. And hopefully that will get the love of science. The whole goal of the camp is to keep campers coming back, even after their first year. And funding is all donation-based. Community feel for the program, that it's based on people just donating and wanting to help the girls. And that kind of support could always help the young girls develop positive, long-lasting friendships. Who's your best friend at camp? I can't pick one. Caitlin Onawa Boysell, Indian Country Today. Jonathan Windy Boy, a legendary Chippewa Cree grass dancer, is being inducted into the Montana Indian Athletic Hall of Fame. Windy Boy began dancing when he was just two years old. He quickly took to the style of grass dancing and was a top competitor through the 80s and 90s. He won 17 championships at the Gathering of Nations Powwow, 14 championships at the United Tribal Grass Dance Competition, and he even danced at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a former tribal leader in Montana and has also been elected to state office. He's currently a member of the Montana House of Representatives. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thawahungva. Chances are you've watched either Rutherford Falls or Reservation Dogs. When we come back, we'll talk Native Roles with Janice Meending, who is in both series. And we'll take a look at what's going on in the fire series, Fire Season in Oregon with Brian Bull. For so long, when it came to seeing Native characters in television programs, you would be hard pressed to find them. Now and then, a character would pop up with a small role, but not as a central character or even a recurring character. One regular Native American character on a television series was John Redcorn, and he was fictional in the animated series King of the Hill. Well, today there are two series streaming on two networks that feature Native writers, directors, and actors. Janice Meeting is in both series, Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs. She joins us today to talk about indigenous visibility in Hollywood. Welcome, Jana. Hi there, thanks for having me. So let's start, what it means to tell these stories. Oh my gosh, it's so meaningful um, on so many different levels. Um, I think um, it's meaningful to me as a person who has been working toward being a performer for many, many years uh, to sort of have this uh, role on Rutherford Falls, especially, but to be a part of a community of native writers who are the ones telling the stories that are put on our uh, put on TVs and uh, streamed in households across Indian country. That's an incredible honor. Um, it's it's a uh, it's high time. I think we are you know, culturally, we're very ready. We're past being ready to see um, our stories told by ourselves um, on TV. And I'm just truly so pleased and so honored to be a part of it. There are so many extraordinary moments in both shows. But one thing that comes up a lot is jokes that really are something only people in Native communities get. And it's okay that it just flies by so fast. How did the thought process come up for that? Well, our showrunner, Sierra Teller Ornelas, is Navajo and Mexican American. And she was really um, instrumental in opening up a writer's room that had native voices uh, centered in the storytelling process. And when that is the case, um, when we are allowed to tell jokes to native people, um, you're just going to see a lot more nuance and what would happen is if it was if it was a joke that was funny in the room and that the non-native writers um, could pick up on and, and laugh with us uh, 
at, that was always, you know, a win. We would put it in the show. And then there were some times where we were like, is this going over um, non-Native audiences' heads? Is it, is it too niche? Um, is it too Native? And Sierra was really, um, you know, pushed us to go there. She said, that's okay. We, we deserve our, uh, our own jokes and our own comedy too. Reagan is already connecting with a lot of people in Indian country, but I'm curious how she's perceived by uh, the uh, other audiences. I think that she has a lot of um, traits that both Native people and non-Native people can identify with. I think her ambition is uh, very true to, the, to our times as uh, young women, adult, young adult women, and um, also her struggles to maintain connection to her community or to, you know, sort of reconnect with her community after being away. She's very intelligent, um, which is something that I don't think uh, we have been given the grace to show on TV. Um, and she also makes mistakes. She's a human being. So uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's a wonderful character to play. And um, there's a, I, I find a lot of myself in her as well. Well, and, and it's that range that's so extraordinary. Somebody who will make mistakes, but also be excellent and, and ambitious. I mean, that's something so often missing from our television. Absolutely. I think you're going to see more and more of these kinds of characters popping up when you have Native writers in the room um, who are telling the story. You're going to just see a range of these characters, much like we are on both Rutherford Falls and now Reservation Dogs. Speaking of characters with ambition, maybe talk to us about the, the clerk at the IHS. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I won't judge her on her lack of ambition. It can be a tough job. Um, but I will say that it was so fun to shoot those scenes um, under the direction of uh, Sydney Freeland and, uh, you know, being there with Sterling Harjo on set and and my friends are who were on set as well are many of them also writers on Rutherford Falls and there's a lot of collabor cross collaboration happening between our two shows um but yeah it was just so fun to be in that scene and to look out into the clinic um and see all of the people sitting in the clinic all of the background actors just like a sea of native people. I think that's a unique experience that um, we are just stepping into and it, it filled my soul to be in that environment. And that's really a broader lesson beyond entertainment is when we talk to people in corporate boards or law or really any profession, they said it's how difficult it is to be the only. And now you have this group of people doing things. How does that change the equation? It's a lot less pressure. Um, I sort of have been doing comedy in uh, New York and Los Angeles as the only native comedian in on this, uh, you know, in the community um, or in the smaller community for a long time. And so I, I recognize the, the amount of pressure that it is to be the only one to and to tell the story accurately and to give my single experience, it's not enough. Um, even though I can hit on the tropes of um, Indian country and what I think we find funny, um, the responsibility to take it on alone is, is pretty great. Um, so I think when you have more voices in the room, you're just gonna get, you know, you open the door to more nuance, you open the door to more uh, diverse jokes, diverse experiences. Um, and that just makes the audience feel more a part of the world of your TV show. We all grow up with television. Um, what were some of the influences uh, that in, what hit you as a child and how did that play into your thinking? Uh, I grew up with Saturday Night Live. I'm a huge Chris Farley fan. Um, I um, you know, as a comedian, I, I followed the work of Margaret Cho. I followed uh, the career of Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> and um, I mean, there's just so many names to pull from. Um, and of course, you know, I look to my own family for inspiration. We're a very funny family and uh, laughter has always been our 
you know, medicine. Um, and yeah, I think that like, like looking to family, looking to community when the representation isn't there. Um, yeah, they're just, I, I mean, I was a huge TV head too. And so I, I've gone through many different eras of, of, uh, aesthetic, <laughs> comedic aesthetic. And, and here I am now. It's amazing to be a part of sort of a new a burgeoning uh, aesthetic for Native people. Michael Gray Eyes plays a character that is one, a strong tribal leader, but he's also playing chess on multiple levels. And how important is that narrative? Uh, it, um, truly so important that we see, um, you know, Terry Thomas, this uh, CEO of a casino and that we don't, you know, uh, downsize him to two dimensions. I think that in, um, in sort of popular media, we see Indian casino bosses as, um, you know, wheeling and dealing and, and uh, you know, sort of shady and shifty and uh, tricky. And we really uh, tried hard to make sure that we were humanizing Terry Thomas. And so, you know, we gave him a whole episode. We made sure that we saw his background and why he is so tough uh, as a grown man, as the CEO of um, Running Thunder. And we, we show him with his family. We show him with his wife and his two kids and, and his kids challenge him. And he's just like, any, you know, any other uh, Indian dad. Um, yeah, so I think it was really important to give him jokes, to give him humor, to give him family, to have let him have an inner world. Um, that's just how you humanize characters for TV. One of the other ways he's humanized is he has to build consensus. And you think of someone just running something by fiat, and it's not that way. And that's something you portray really well. Yeah, it's really fun to sort of play uh, a play with and against Terry Thomas as Regan because he has this sort of standing with the community that Regan really needs. And so it was a really good time to uh, not only be able to challenge Terry Thomas and sort of tease him, um, but also to let him uh, turn Regan into this sort of shark. He has a lot of lessons that she needs to learn. So it was a really fun time playing with Michael. He's an amazing uh, co-star. Is there anything you can tell us about season two? Uh, uh, no, but I will say that we see a lot of uh, the same characters and a lot of new characters. It's going to be a, a really good time. We look forward to it. Thank you, Jana. Thanks so much. And we'll be right back. The Western United States is once again facing deadly forest fires. The Jack fire that started on July 5th in Oregon is still burning and it's only 51% contained. The human caused fire has burned about 24,000 acres on the Umpqua National Forest land near Eugene, Oregon. Windy and stormy weather conditions set firefighters back. Lightning caused almost 40 new fires nearby. KLCC reporter Brian Bull joins us with this update. He's a member of the Nez Perce tribe of Idaho. Welcome, Brian. That's my way, Mark. How are you? Good. Let's start with the big picture and what you're seeing on the ground. So all across the Pacific Northwest right now, including the Rockies area, there are dozens of fires, at least 70 to 75 by my count, that are burning and consuming a lot of acreage, including many of those near uh, tribes. Right now in Oregon itself, we do not seem to have a lot of troublesome fires at this point that are affecting most of the tribes, but I will go to say that the Klamath people have experienced the bootleg fire, which was for a while one of the nation's largest blazes. It's burned about 414,000 acres, even though it's 100% contained right now. Many tribal officials are very deeply concerned about the forest's ability to rebound and they lament the loss of traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering grounds that their uh, tribal members have used for generations. 
up in Colville, uh, we have the Summit Trail fire and Whitmore fire, uh, which have uh, burned just collectively more than 106,000 acres and wildfire fighters are right now trying to contain that more. Uh, well, about six years ago, the Colville suffered a major loss when 382,000 acres were burned and the estimated damages to commercial timber interest were at uh, $100 million at last estimate. In fact, earlier this month, the Colville announced that they were uh, filing a federal lawsuit against the federal government. They alleged that the uh, feds lacked fire prevention measures such as fuel breaks and prioritize other fires during the 2015 wildfire season. So there is certainly a lot to monitor here on the ground and many efforts continue, especially through uh, Montana and uh, parts of the uh, upper Can Canadian area as well. But uh, yeah, there's no immediate end in sight. Right now we're just experiencing a respite with some cooler temperatures, but some of the meteorologists I've talked to say that we may still see you know, another triple digit heat wave come through, which certainly challenges firefighters on the ground. You know, one part of that that um, isn't often the first thought is just the serious health complications for people throughout the region, um, ranging from chronic respiratory disease to other breathing problems. That's very true, Mark. In fact, uh, I felt it myself. Uh, when we have all these fires happening in a concentrated area for such a sustained period, a uh, wildfire official told me that the season started early and will end late. We're in a lot of terrain that has a lot of deep valleys and gorges. And so a lot of times that wildfire, that smoke has nowhere to go. In fact, uh, one community that's about 45 miles to the southeast of us uh, had its air quality degraded down to very unhealthy levels. Uh, that was near a, a complex called the Middle Fork Complex. But these all collectively gather and a lot of smoke will travel from one area to the other, depending on how the winds dissipate. And for a lot of people who are sensitive to particulates in the air, uh, infants, pregnant mothers, elders, uh, this can pose a very significant hazard. That also includes people who have respiratory and cardiac illnesses as well. So a lot of people are being advised right now through wildfire season to stay indoors and keep their AC running and keep changing out their furnace filters frequently to make sure that they're not getting that particular matter into their system. And, and the irony there is that the more air conditioners you have, particularly Northwest, because they're not used to them, it adds to the climate change that's fueling so much of this. It's, it's a cycle, Mark. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a circular kind of problem because uh, last month, we had a heat wave come through, a heat dome, it was called, that might have been late June, that we had triple digit highs. And this is a region that is not used to significant surges in high temperatures. The majority of people who died, or I believe 116 people who died in Oregon alone, uh, were people who lived in units that did not have air conditioning. And so, as you can imagine, there's been a huge rush to go out and get AC units and filtration units. Um, but again, that simply adds to the problem as well. So we are still looking at uh, the effects of climate change. The United Nations Climate Change Report that came out earlier this month suggests that by the end of the century, we're going to see rises in temperatures by one to three degrees Celsius, which will exasperate many situations for people both on and off reservation communities. We're looking at uh, tribes that are concerned about the long-term effects on forests, but also on fish, plant, and insect species as well. Uh, and you look around the globe, and it's really not just the West, and the UN climate report talks about the increasing danger of wildfire. Um, but Russia, Greece, there's so many places in the world that are going through this exact same thing because of the change in the climate. Yeah, it was very surreal to look at all the footage that was being shot around the Pacific Northwest of all these wildfires, but then they cut to uh, incidents that were happening in Greece and, and, as you said, Russia too. And we're seeing that this is becoming a much more um, <laughs> unfortunate common incidence as temperatures increase. The uh, top 10 global uh, carbon emissions include China, the United States, the European Union, India, Russia, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia and Canada. And just to see this concentration of the issue happening across some of the most major countries, 
you know, it does really drive up the urgency for these nations to get together and try to limit carbon emissions. And, you know, the dire warning about the global change or the global warming report by the United Nations is that we're past the tipping point. We're going to see in the next two to three decades an increase in global, temp global temperatures. Uh, so at best, what we can do is we can kind of limit the effects by trying to reduce carbon emissions right away. And that's going to be a point of discussion, I think, as the uh, Global Commission continues addressing the issue with world leaders. Right, in fact, they meet again in November uh, in Scotland for that very issue. Indeed. And going back to the native communities here, the National Congress of American Indians had put out a statement that said that among the uh, most vulnerable populations that are going to be affected by climate change are Alaskan native villagers. Uh, a federal report that they quote says that 86% of Alaskan native villages are going to become susceptible to flooding and erosion, and 31 villages will qualify for permanent relocation. And in fact, the EPA has also said that over the next 40 to 80 years, they're going to see the loss of more than half of the salmon and trout habitats, which are very important to those tribes. So again, we're past the tipping point here, and it seems like the best that we can do collectively is try to put the brakes on it, but we're still looking at significant increases in temperature. Brian Bull, thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care and be well. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.